Welcome to Bears in the Kitchen. This is a virtual cook along. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a registered dietitian. I work at UHS, University Health Services on campus. Um, and what this series is all about is really just me trying to share simple, affordable, nutritious, tasty recipes with you all. Um, so that you can, you know, do it at home and, and cook at home. Let me, I do want to share with you all one great tool. So I always like starting these classes this way, um, just because I get a lot of questions from students that are essentially asking, you know, how do I, like, what's a healthy meal or what's a balanced meal? And so this is great, just a great place to start in terms of going over basics. Here we have uh, the guideline called My Plate, and this is um, developed by the USDA, our government, and they essentially the, the main takeaways here are, you know, for a balanced meal, we're striving for including the different food groups. So, you know, is there a veggie or fruit part of the meal? Is there some type of starch? Is there some type of protein? Um, and that, and so having those components makes a meal more balanced. Um, and then the second takeaway, too, is noticing the proportion of each of the food groups. So noticing that, you know, we try to aim for 50% of our plate fruits and or veggies, um, a quarter of it, 25%, some type of starch, 25% of the rest of the plate, some type of protein. And now, I think what's really cool about having this type of guideline is very flexible. So... Um, and it can be applied to really any type of uh, type of cuisine or food that you're eating. So whether that's you know traditional American stuff here, or you also have just traditional American food with the pasta and baked chicken. Um, on the lower right uh, would be like Mexican cuisine, right? You're still um, you have this, the components of like the veggie piece, some type of starch, some type of protein. And so when thinking about even today's recipe that I'm going to be um, going, with, going over with you all, uh, which is a chicken tinga, uh, essentially, we're going to be cooking raw chicken. <laughs> um, if you didn't get raw chicken, you may have gotten rotisserie chicken, and you have cooked chicken ready to go. Then we're just going to um, – then it's just talking about how to season it. Um, and what's great about this recipe is that once you have the seasoned meat, you could really, it's very versatile. You could make tacos with it, which is what I'm gonna be eating tonight and showing you all. You could, you know, put it as your protein in like a burrito. You could, you know, add it just to like rice and a plate of rice and beans, like build your my plate. Um, so it, it's cool. And you can also uh, freeze it too if you want to like do a batch, right? Great to add in soups and like I said, super versatile, which is why I chose uh, the recipe and just using so we're going to be focusing on that protein piece how to flavor it and then you know how do you balance that meal is okay well I'm going to make tacos so I, I'm going to have the um, tortillas here right that's going to be um, one of my main starches and then veggies right if I wanted to do a salad or like do guac something that would be a way to balance things out okay so first thing we want to do if we take a look at the recipe list which Ami has put in the chat box if you don't already have access to it. We want to make the chicken first because it's really, it's actually pretty simple to do the seasoning for the chicken tinga. But first, um, again, if you're, you can already use like leftover chicken or pre-shredded chicken, like buy a whole rotisserie chicken and just use it in that way. Um, but I did want to go over how do you cook? I, I know a lot of students, because um, I do one-on-one -on -one counseling with students. And when we talk about, you know, they're comfortable like their comfort level with cooking, uh, I do hear a lot of students that say, I don't, I don't touch raw meat. Like, I'm not comfortable. You know, for those who are omnivores that eat plants and eat um, animal meat, usually they'll say, or I hear a lot that, oh, no, like at home, like I tend to just not eat meat. But if I go out to eat, that's when I'll order it. So I think a lot of people may be a little um, nervous about handling raw meat. So I think you know, going over how to do a basic chicken, like how to cook chicken um, and shred it. Again, shred, shredded chicken, I think, is very versatile. So that's what I want to go over with you all today. 
Um, on, so that's on the second uh, recipe on the bottom here, uh, shredded chicken, which we're going to be making with raw meat. Um, and I have that right here. Um, if you are cooking along, just be sure to, you know, before, um, before starting, you know, wash your hands, uh, warm soapy water, 20 seconds. I've already done that. If you haven't, go ahead and um, do that right now. Uh, let's see. We do, so what we'll need to cook the, I'm going to be boiling um, or poaching the chicken. So using water to cook it. Uh, we're going to need a pot, which I have here too. Um, just a pot of water. I've already added some water in there, a medium-sized pot. And then I'm going to add one pound of the raw, um, either boneless chicken breast or boneless thigh meat, which you can um, commonly find at the grocery store. Also to this, I'm going to add half of the white onion. So I'm going to slice that into quarters and then um, add some garlic cloves in there, three large garlic cloves just smashed, and um, one teaspoon of salt to this. So before I even deal with the raw chicken, because we want to make sure we don't do any cross-contamination with the raw, um, I'm going to keep this cutting board clean for the produce. Um, here, so we want half of an onion. And just, oops, <laughs> just to show you, too, I've already taken off the outer layer, so make sure you take off the outer layer, so that's why it's kind of shiny. Um, shiny there. Already, so I'm going to cut this in half. This is a pretty big onion. Okay, and so it says make quarters. So essentially, you don't have to do any fancy knife work because we're going to essentially be using this onion to flavor the, the chicken, and you can actually use the broth, the leftover, um, for something else too, which is cool. I'm going to cut off just the end there, a little dry, and then I can cut off the the root part, Oops, there, um, quarter it, something like that. That's all, that's all it is, right? Four sections. And then we want three big cloves, excuse me. Yeah, garlic cloves. Um, so I'm just gonna, we want to, so be careful when you do this. This is, I don't know if this is a bad habit. You don't wanna cut yourself on the sharp end. Um, but I find just smashing it is one of the easiest ways to peel garlic and deal with it. Ami actually just shared with me that we could throw in with the skin too, since we're boiling and we're not something that you don't want it. It's not edible, but if you take it out, it can leave, it can be very flavorful. So maybe I'll just leave it on. Was that right, Ami? Just leave on the skin of garlic and it adds extra flavor? Yeah, it has a little bit of the garlic oil kind of embedded in it. And so if you're just throwing it into like flavor, you know, something you're boiling, then it doesn't really matter because you're going to strain all that out anyways. All right. So I am going to take that hint. That's something new I learned today. I was learning. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to throw in the garlic there. I'm going to throw in half of my ordered onions in here too. And then add in one teaspoon of salt. Now you can use, let's see, let me get my teaspoon. Um, got a teaspoon of salt there. Okay, so that, now it's ready for the chicken. So we wanna do this because the chicken takes some time to cook. Um, some folks, uh, I know it may not be as common, but some students do have access to like a um, crock pot. A crock pot. <laughs> yes. Slow cooker, um, slow cooker, crock pot is a brand. Slow cooker or crock pot <laughs> that kind of just um, cooks things on slow, like slow and you just leave it there and it just cooks throughout the day or like over hours, um, which is great because you, it's kind of like a dump recipe and you just leave it and then at the end of the day you can have your meal ready. So some people actually do this with chicken or like um, that's a way for them to get like shredded chicken too. But we're we're just gonna go stove top today. And so here I have my I I took away my cutting board just to keep it clean. Now here is the raw chicken. 
okay? The recipe calls for one pound. And of course, you can easily, I think this is an easy recipe to do, um, to make a batch of or make a larger amount. So you can always like multiply by one and a half, multiply by two, and just make a bunch of shredded chicken and um, have different ways of cooking it. So this is one and a half. Um, here, I'm just gonna pop in. <laughs> and so again, it's boneless. You could also cook with bone in too, and that bone would just um, contribute to the flavor of this broth that we'll be getting just as a byproduct of cooking the chicken. And with that, again, be very aware of um, cross-contamination. So if you've handled the raw chicken, like I'm gonna go wash my hands real quick. You can use tongs if you don't want to actually touch the chicken too. You know, some people are squirmish. So in addition to making the chicken, they're also making like a chicken stock as a byproduct? Mm -hmm. You can absolutely build, um, some folks will just toss the, the water. So I'm gonna take this here and bring it to the stove. And um, so right now the temperature I have the stove on is high. So what we wanna do is bring up the, um, bring up the water to a boil. Um, but we wanna, don't wanna keep it at a boil. Once it's at a boil, we're gonna bring it down to like a low medium heat and let it cook for about 20 minutes or so. Um, now cooking time could be could vary depending on like the thickness of the chicken or how much chicken you're cooking, how big your pot is. Um, so it's not an exact science or it's not exact um, timing there, but 20 minutes is a good once you can bring it up, uh, bring it down to a simmering from that boil, which will take a little bit. Um, then 20 minutes is a good place to. Um, start checking the temperature to see if the chicken is cooked. Um, so I do have, and hopefully you all have one too, if you're cooking with raw meat, uh, a thermometer. So this is a food thermometer. No, where, what? Oh, there you go. A food thermometer, not fancy. They have digital ones and non-digital. This is the old school, non-digital one. And um, to cook, and this is one, uh, I think, of the reasons why people get a little uh, worried too. They don't want to accidentally eat raw meat understandable, so want to get salmonella or a different foodborne illness. Um, what I like about some of the actual holders will have like a little cheat sheet. So even on my thermometer holder here, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it gives you the internal temperature of, uh, of this type of meat when it's cooked. So for poultry, which we're going to be cooking today um, with the chicken, that is 165. So that's what temperature we're aiming for in the thickest part of the meat when after 20 minutes of simmering on the stove top. So we will be bringing this back later. Just keeping an eye. Um, something that I've read too is that if you, um, the reason why we want to pack at 20 minutes is that you can easily cook, like make the chicken where it's too rubbery and like overcook it. So that's what we want to try to avoid. Um, if it's still not at 165 temperature, internal temperature, then we can just put it back in for another five minutes until, and then keep checking to avoid overcooking it. Um, so that's that. The chicken just has to cook now. <laughs> We've done as much as we can for it. Um, so I'm going to bring back my uh, clean cutting board here. And in the meanwhile, and I, I just keep poking to see, uh, excuse me, looking to see if it is boiling yet and it still hasn't been. Um, once it boils, bring it down. I'll put the timer on for 20 minutes. Now, in the meanwhile, we can go to the ingredients of how to make the um, chicken tinga, so the actual sauce that we're going to be marinating the cooked chicken with. What it says here on the recipe card is that we are going to need, we'll have the oil, canola oil, cooking oil. 
um, one medium white onion whole sliced. Um, and so we can prep that. We're going to prep the three large garlic cloves, minced fat, um, so cut it really small, and then three large tomatoes. And we'll get our uh, chipotle peppers in adobo sauce ready. Great flavor and some spice too, if you like spicy. But you don't have to make it spicy. We could just keep it to two chipotle peppers and get the flavor that we're looking for. And then we add the shredded chicken, and that's really it, salt and pepper. You're ready to eat tacos or a burrito or rice and beans. <laughs> so let's just cut up the produce then. So I'm, I want one whole onion here. And my hands are clean because I already washed it from the raw chicken. Uh, just as a reminder, too, when you're working with produce, you want you don't want to be um, – you want to try to make your flat surface so it's easier to cut and you have more control versus if you're on the edges, right? Like you might accidentally cut yourself pretty easily um, if, you, if you're working with all rounds. So that's us cutting it in half. Then working with the half is a lot easier than trying to work with the whole and have it roll around. Um, I've kept the root on because it keeps it in state. It keeps it together versus it falling apart. Just find that it's easier to do that. Um, personally, and I want to have my bear claw again. This is just um, basic uh, safety rules to consider when cooking. Um, holding the knife, this is a chef knife, larger knife at the hilt here, so you have more control versus sometimes I see folks holding it at the end, right, um, where you don't have as much control, and so you're, you are at higher risk of accidentally cutting yourself because you don't have that much control. So bring it up to here if you're not already there. Um, my bear claw, meaning my, I haven't had my bear claw on my left hand because I'm right-handed, and then you want to tuck in your fingers, right? So I've got my bear claw, and also want to tuck in my thumb, too. Sometimes people leave it out. They forget about it. You know, you can imagine. Ouch. Um, so for, with the onion, we want to slice it, meaning I'm just going to do thin slices. Now this is... The root is on top here. That's what I'm doing. So you get a nice slice. Then slices. This is all going to cook down in our sauce. And then you want to make sure that we will chop the end, that root end too. It would be quite fibrous if we tried to eat that and cook that down. And I'm Taking a peek at the chicken, and it's boiling a little, so I'm going to bring it to low medium now. I wonder, I want to show you all, too, what it looks like. So you can see the, the water going, and I brought it to a medium, low medium, between low and medium heat. So I brought it down from high because it's already boiling. I'm going to set my timer for 20 minutes. So Elizabeth, would you say that a simmer has a little bit of bubbling to it or is it, like how would you describe a simmer? Yes, yeah, simmer has um, small bubbles versus if it's at high heat, usually it's like a ton of bubbles. <laughs> or it's voraciously um, bubbling and larger bubbles too. But the simmer is, um, you will see like smaller bubbles and it's not as strong. I also wanted to add for people who are unfamiliar with chipotles, they're actually dried and smoked jalapenos. So that's why they're so spicy. And then the smoke just adds a little bit of a different flavor, but it still keeps the spiciness. That's why Elizabeth was being cautious about the spice levels. Thank you. Okay, cool. So let's see. Um, at the end of the onion, too, sometimes it gets a little not as stable, so I'll just flip it over again. Uh, flat edges are your friend when you're trying to cut up produce. So then I can just finish it up. And also, too, noticing this is a little slidey, more slippery. Um, usually it's not this slippery. So for cutting boards, good reminder, um, should have reminded in the beginning 
is to have something at the bottom of the cutting board to make sure that it doesn't slip and slide while you're cutting, which is a little what it did on me right now. Um, I had a, a cardboard underneath, but that's not enough friction for me. So I'm just gonna get a towel. So if you don't already have one, I would recommend getting a towel or wetting a paper towel if you have, that works too. Um, just so you, you know, make sure, again, for stability. And you see there. Um, so here's a half onion. Let me do the other half. I'm just gonna put it to make more room. I have a little bowl or area I can put that in. So I'm just cut the rest. Again, we're slicing the onion. I'm gonna turn it over because it's a little not steady. And go at whatever pace you are comfortable with. Um, better to be safe than sorry and have an accident. Cut the edge here. Don't want to eat the roots. Okay, so onions. Oh, onions and the tears. Okay. So we got the onions ready to go. Um, next, we can prep the three large, oops, three large garlic cloves minced. These are four garlic cloves. I know some people even love more garlic. You can add, you can add honestly however much garlic you want. Um, but three is a good place to start. These are kind of small, so I'm gonna do four. But I really, I love garlic. Well, I'll flavor. So I'm gonna smash these guys because that's my cheat way of peeling them with so garlic I know can be a pain to peel. Elizabeth I have a question. Um, sure. What's the difference in like flavor or maybe strength of flavor between fresh garlic and like canned minced garlic and like garlic oh. butter? Is it all the same? Oh, like butter? <laughs> um, so yeah, compared, cause you're thinking about the, the, when you're working with fresh garlic, you have, as soon as you cut and make, make a hit on the garlic, you have like aromatic compounds that are released, right? This is the, the stuff that is good for us and that makes it smell and taste so good. Um, so with time that will, it kind of lose flavor. So I've, you know, I try to, if you can, if you have access to it, um, fresh garlic, I think, will give you the strongest um, flavor hit because it's fresh. And again, those aromatic compounds um, are being released actively as soon as you cut it. Um, compared to, you know, like, Trader Joe's or Safeway will have the pre-minced garlic um, in a jar, which is, like, super convenient. I'm not going to lie. Um, but it's not as aromatic. And to me, like, the flavor, you know, it takes – takes a hit on quality, but you get the convenience, right? So are you someone who is not even like hates peeling and you're like, even if I buy it, it just goes old and gets really dry and I never get to it. Uh, then it's worth it, I think, to take the compromise there and just buy it in a jar if you know you're going to use it. Um, and then there's also dried too, like dried, uh, what is it, like ground powder, there's flakes, um, which I think is pretty good. Right? If you don't, especially if you don't have um, fresh too, it'll get the job done. All of them will get the job done. It's just how much of a garlic fan are you? If you're like, no, nah, I just need a little bit, then any of those are fine. Um, I love garlic, so <laughs> like I, I like having it fresh if I can. And so we're gonna mince it, as it says here. Um, mincing is means essentially just cutting it really small little fine cubes. So I am cutting it uh, lengthwise first. And then we'll, I mean, you really don't have to do, you can kind of, there's no real, um, because it's minced anyways, you can really just go like this too. <laughs> that works. Doesn't have to be as fine or delicate. And your slices. So you can just go like this, use this for a little bit more control. Okay. 
if you still got big pieces like I do, unless, again, unless you like the big chunks in your food, that's totally fine too. If you want it a little bit more dispersed into the sauce that we're going to be making for the chicken pinga, then just keep going a little more, like back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so that looks pretty good to me. If you can see how small that is, that's pretty good mint. All right, so we've got our garlic, and of course my nose is running from the onions, and so is my, are my eyes every time. <laughs> you can always pause too, and. Uh, Sometimes if, if you're really sensitive to if you're really sensitive to onion and it makes you cry every time, um, it's like the the compounds that are left on your knife, like sometimes I'll just go wash my knife and even get a new cutting board and that kind of cools things down a little bit. Um, so next we have three large tomatoes. Great, so I just have these guys here. And we want to tube these. They're going to be cooked down to like a stewy type thing anyways. So, again, it doesn't really matter if, you know, they're not as like uniform and, and tube or cut. Um, again, I want to work on a flat surface, right? So that's why I cut it in half there. And then it makes it a lot easier to then cut. Elizabeth, when you have a second, would you mind holding up the uh, garlic and tomatoes to the camera just a little bit closer? Just for mm -hmm. a second, just to um, show for the people who might be cooking from a distance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Here, if I should make. Okay, so I'm cutting these tomatoes into cubes. Okay. I'm gonna get an, I have another bowl. Put these tomatoes in on the side. So I'm keeping these separate from the onions. I have another quick question. Um, so a lot of cooking shows say you have to cut everything uniform and all of that, but is it as important if you're cooking something like a stew or a sauce? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, exactly because, so the reason why cooking shows do typically like good form or what whatnot, um, good practice to, to cut more uniformly is because, um, Depending, it depends on you know what method of cooking you're doing, but generally speaking, they they want uniform pieces because they want it to cook at the same um, cook at the same rate. Because if you have like let's say you're doing a stir fry or you're cooking something in the oven and roasting it right with the air um, hot air method, that could if you cut things like really big and really small. Um, they're not going to cook at the same rate, and so you're, you're going to have uh, food that is not cooked. Like some some pieces are cooked and some aren't, or you're going to have pieces that some, half of it isn't is cooked and half of it is super overcooked. Uh, so that's that's the recommend the reason why. But if you're putting it into a soup or a stew, um, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so we got about 10 minutes, nine minutes uh, or on my um, on my timer, about nine minutes left to go before we check the chicken. And if you see it like super stagnant again, just bolster it up a little bit. But yeah, I'm at like low medium. 
or medium low. <laughs> so this is my third, my third tomato. I'm cutting up, kind of taking my time because there's not much prep to do here. <laughs> it's like a soup. This is a real simple recipe, actually. And so when I get to test and think about what kind of recipes would be student friendly, really just like adult cooking friendly too, but especially student friendly. Um, I'll have some recipes that I like just from my experience and and um, following things. Like I put it into like this is probably a recipe that I would put into my rotation of stuff that I cook. Right? I think it's helpful to, um, especially if you're just beginning or like just learning to, to get familiar with cooking. Um, it can be really overwhelming when you, you know, dive into IG or like cookbooks and things are really comp can be get really complicated and the ingredient list can can get long quick. Um, and so you you forget like you want to have some recipes that you're confident in making. So you don't need to know like 50 recipes. Um, it's nice to just have like say five go-to recipes as a place to start and just think about it like that because the more that you do it, right, the more you get comfortable and it just becomes part of your repertoire. So then you kind of go around. Um, and sometimes I get, you know, like I'll get in a rut too. I'm like, I don't know what to cook. And so um, sometimes I'll just go back to my old things that I cook, just to like a scrapbook or um, on my phone, looking at photos, just to remind myself, oh yeah, I cooked that. <laughs> and so do I feel like eating that, you know, this week or today? So um, oh, yep. Yeah. Question? Quick question from Angie. Can you use diced uh, canned tomatoes if you don't have fresh tomatoes? Yes, absolutely. So the amount here, this is this was three, maybe like large, good size, I guess medium size tomatoes. Actually, this is three large tomatoes. This is probably why I ordered more tomatoes. I'm going to add another tomato. So that would be about you know, if a 12 ounce can is like the typical canned um, diced tomatoes, um, maybe about like two, I think like about two cans of those would be good for, for the amount of chicken of one pound. Um, what's cool about those is that you can get like fire roasted, which adds a little bit more flavor. Um, so yeah, this could, this could definitely be, you could substitute that. Good question. Actually, good point, too, because as we're moving into fall, right, tomatoes are out of season. And usually they're, they're hot and actually, I don't know, with our weather, too, I know some folks that still have tomatoes on the vine um, or they're growing in their backyard. But typically, tomatoes are like a, a summer, maybe early fall fruit, vegetable fruit. But yeah, so during winter months, great substitute just get some canned food um, tomatoes, or diced, excuse me. E-M-B-A-S-A, -A, that's the brand that I bought, commonly so found, I found it at Safeway. Is it this one that you're talking about? Uh, Embasa. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah Embasa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had your video hidden. Um, so that's, that's the one. Yeah, OK, great. Um, so yeah, I just put it in a Tupperware. <laughs> um, so very common, you can find it in, like in the ethnic food aisle um, of most grocery stores, even like the popular American grocery stores. I got this at Safeway. Um, and they're like fairly economical too. I think they're like less than two bucks and you get a lot of peppers, right? So I put on the recipe, you could do two to five Chipotle or you could some people do more, right? Depends on your own heat level. If you just want flavor, I would say do two. Um, if you want a little bit more heat, do five, six, or more. <laughs> and you can taste it too there. Um, can taste it just to see the flavor. I'm going to do three. Actually, I'll add the sauce too um, because the actual peppers have the spice and the seeds and the peppers. Um, if you want a little bit more flavor, you can always just add a little bit of the sauce in the can. 
think that's what I did too when I tested this recipe. How would you describe yeah, the flavor of the sauce? Oh, that is spicy. <laughs> it's got like a seed. <laughs> um, it's, it, oh, yeah, because as you had mentioned, Ami, um, it's, um, it's like because they smoke it, it's like a smoky flavor, which is nice. If anyone has tried like smoked paprika or anything smoked, um, smoked barbecue, right? It's that wood, it sounds kind of weird, like woodsy, woody taste. That isn't for, I mean, on, it's not for everybody, um, but it's, I think it's a nice flavor, especially when you add it to chicken or some type of meat, you know, common um, for a chicken tinga, you could do like pork tinga, you could do, um, be, or use different proteins too, but mainly you'll have this sauce. The sauce is just super easy. Um, I think traditionally too, uh, some folks, some uh, many other recipes that I saw would actually blend the sauce together I was going like the most easiest route, like one less appliance to deal with. And some people don't have blenders, which is why, um, yeah, this one is just straight, like you don't even need to blend the sauce. But commonly, if you look up chicken tinga, a lot of folks will blend the sauce first and then pour it. Um, but I think if we like finally, I think it's fine. I don't think we need to. Because when I did it, it still tasted good. You still get the flavors. Hmm. Really? Now I'm just waiting for the chicken, y'all. <laughs> so if you're cooking too, you're probably waiting for the chicken. I have 30 more seconds to go. And um, so I'm going to get... I got to do a move again. Um, quick question. If they don't have a thermometer, how would you recommend they check the doneness of their chicken? They don't have a thermometer... Oh, I would want to make sure it's really cut. <laughs> um, I would cut in. If you didn't have another choice, I would have to cut in. You'd want to cut into the thickest part and just check to see if there's any pink. Sometimes there's like a like a a pink water that oops, um that comes out, and you know that that's not ready. So you would have to cut in. Um, which like the the potential the downside of that is if you're cutting in and you're like oh it's still pink and then you put it back in um it's more chance to get overdone or overcooked so it might be a little tough but i think with with this recipe though um because there is acidity you get acidity from the tomatoes um and then like you got the peppers going on like leave it overnight I think it's fine. like it, it. It'll. I think it's actually a better recipe overnight because the meat gets to sit in the sauce, and um, also with the acidity that will break down proteins. And so I think it. Um, I think it's not the end of the world if you accidentally overcook a little bit. Better to overcook than undercook with chicken for sure. This isn't meat or steak that we're talking about where you can do like your rare, medium rare, right? Um, salmonella is unforgiving. <laughs> so. Uh, we really want to make sure that that gets cooked. Um, and so the benefits of using the thermometer then, right, is that uh, it's less complicated. So what I'm going to do is get a bowl. I want to take out the chicken to test it and not take the temperature inside the hot water, too, because it's going to mess up. Um, potentially mess up your reading. So if you see here, I had chicken thigh meat compared to chicken breast. Chicken breast tends to be like huger and thicker. So mine's actually probably going to be cooked. Oh, let me bring it here. I always forget which camera. Um, so that's actually pretty small, right? What I'm going to do then is go to thickest piece the thickest part, and then you'll see the temperature rise slowly. Nice. We're trying to hit for poultry, chicken, turkey. We're trying to get to uh, 165, above 165. So it's going. The digital might be faster, but it's okay. Then you have to worry about batteries. 
I'm gonna... I can verify that digital is fa- very faster, much faster. <laughs> yeah. I have both. I uh, my digital just happened to run out of battery, <laughs> so it's something you have to reorder. Oops, excuse me. There you go. The other benefit for these kind of thermometers that um, Elizabeth is using is a lot of them are oven proof. So if you're doing something like um, cooking your meat in an oven, you can actually just leave the thermometer in. Check the packaging, of course, but they're much more durable to heat. Whereas with electronic ones, you really do not want to put them in an oven oh, ever. Right. And so because my meat it stopped going high but I was like this has to be done and so because the meat is actually it's the piece of meat is not as thick um I decided to go a different way to make sure the the thermometer contacts like totally contacts um the meat otherwise it's contacting air it's gonna mess up your reading so yeah as you can see there uh there's that 160 and probably depending for my angle it's at one 68. <laughs> so it's done. It's good. So I want to rescue my chickens because I don't want them to get overcooked. And um, again, I'm pretty confident because this is, these pieces are quite small. But if you're uh, especially working with chicken breasts, again, I know they tend to be larger pieces of meat. They tend to be a lot thicker too. Um, you want to, when you put your thermometer in, you really want to make sure that you go for the thickest part because that's the part that's most likely going to be not cooked thoroughly if there is a part or not cooked to temperature yet. Um, I, I can show you too what it, just what it looks like. Um, if you don't, if you happen to not have a thermometer, I think it's a really, it's a necessary investment. The next time you can get it, um, I think I bought some online for maybe it was less than five dollars on me how much did it do you remember thermometers costing <laughs> oh <laughs> definitely like less than 10. okay yeah i think 450 is what i saw online um yeah they have all sorts of like digital and um i guess old-timey ones available for even like five dollars um for like maybe a pack of two so um, like Walmart, Amazon, Target, all of them are good options. It may be kind of hard to see. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the meat's quite, um, this piece of meat is quite thin because it's the thigh. Um, I don't see any, I mean, just to verify, like, if you didn't have, you'd be looking for a pink redness. And sometimes, too, when you, like, push push in, you see, um, like, pink water come out. It may not be as thick as blood, but if you see, like, pink pinkness anywhere um, and then like pink fluid come out it needs a little bit more time and I would put it in for five minute increments because again you don't want to go over so this looks good okay and since we're here right what is chicken broth chicken broth or any type of broth <laughs> like they have vegetable broth and beef and pork right um, it's really just usually cooked water, cooked with the, the meat source, um, usually bones. We just happen to cook with the meat. That still has some flavor. The bones are going to have more flavor. Again, you could do bone in and cook it. It would just take a little bit longer because the bone's in. And then you flavor it. So whatever spices, whatever um, vegetables, very commonly for stock, people will put onions, uh, garlic, celery, carrots, that kind of profile. Um, most common, and then, you know, of course, you have to like salt it and uh, put whatever spices that you're trying to go for. But yeah, so it's like, we want to keep this. You can keep this. <laughs> okay. Um, so the chicken is cooked. We have all these things that we have. Uh, so we want to shred it. It's going to be very hot. So um, I think the recipe says just let it let it chill for a little, or like let it sit. Oh, let the chicken cool five or ten minutes. I mean, you don't have to. I want to like 
set it right away. You just don't want to burn yourself by accident. Please don't do that. Um, so as much as you can. Actually, I think an easy way to shred is to get two forks. So that was missing. So you don't have like direct contact with your fingers or limited, yeah, limited contact. And you just start shredding away, <laughs> meaning that um, tearing it apart. And you'll notice the the fibers of the meat too, right, are are long wise. So try to keep it. Try not to cut the fibers short, I guess. So, oops. Here. So the fiber is long wise. Naturally, the fiber. Well, we'll just spend the next five minutes or so shredding your chicken. Some people have. I mean, there's so many different hacks that require appliances to shredding chicken, um, but I think this is honestly the easiest way. Um, chicken pinga, like you think about how you're going to be using this chicken. I'm going to be putting it in tacos, so I want to get. I, I like. I want it a little more fine, and uh, I don't want as big pieces. Also, too, with the big um, the more that you shred it, the more the sauce can take over, and so it'll be more flavorful. I remember when I first made this recipe, I got lazy, <laughs> and I, I left some, like, big chicken pieces, and then I was like, oh, man, it's not as flavorful. It's like, of course, because um, it didn't get as much surface area in touch with the sauce. This could be like your me time too. Just relaxing, shredding chicken. <laughs> and it's cool. If you did, you know, one pound is, if, you, if it's just you, um, one pound might be a good amount of chicken to work with. Um, if you want to think about, you know, prepping for the week, right, you could do one pound, you could do two pounds of chicken. Um, and maybe do, you know, if you want to do tacos or, uh, burrito one night you could do that and then take out this recipe if you wanted to keep the other pound um, for something else just to keep things you know fresh and having different flavor profiles then you can just keep some shredded chicken for your uh, for your salad or you can do like a chicken salad and put that in a sandwich or you know you can use this chicken for so many things is there a huge flavor difference between, um, I guess, uh, chicken thighs and chicken breasts? I mean, obviously, one is like a darker meat and one is a lighter meat, but taste-wise. Mm. People will have very strong opinions about this, I feel. <laughs> um, I, yeah, to, to me, I think because there's dark meat, meaning that there's more actually higher content of iron in the thighs and you think about it you know you think about a chicken and what are the muscles that are working harder right it's going to be those thighs that carry in that chicken which is why there's higher uh, iron content in it which i think is kind of cool if you break it down that way um so many people will say like oh they, they do like the thigh better because it's more flavorful um some people i think the american palate is really used to chicken breast they just like clean simple um, chicken breast and it, it tends to be larger cuts of meat too and you know we tend to eat larger portion sizes of uh, meat especially chicken people love chicken um, so personal but it can come down to like a personal I think preference we're almost there folks And we're doing pretty good on time. It's a little bit past six by a couple of minutes. So just in time for everybody to enjoy their hard work. <laughs> yeah, we're almost there, I promise. See, the prep for the, the tinga sauce was so um, pretty simple. Essentially, we just sliced up tomatoes, or we cubed tomatoes, and we chopped up an onion and cut up some garlic, and we have our chipotle Okay. This so meal sounds meat. really cool. Yeah. 
I'm hungry. I'm ready to eat. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. <laughs> And think about it too, like tacos. Okay, I know Tuesday taco night, right? Sure, we're in a pandemic. It's a little different now, but um, you're lucky if you get like a dollar, two dollar tacos. Uh, tacos can get quite expensive, so this really like meat in general costs more. If you're talking about diff like protein, like plant protein versus animal protein, but um, you do this at home, like how many tacos could you make? So many tacos. You could upcharge to charge your friends, be like, hey, my tacos are better and they're cheaper. Um, okay, cool. This is good enough. Um, what's great too is that because we are keeping an eye on being mindful of how long we are cooking the chicken, the chicken is, is not dry, right? You can see here. It's still quite um, moist. And I think that's awesome chicken. That's a fear of some people too, that when they make this or they're cooking it in the water that they um, have in a pan putting it on medium on heat here. And then what does it say next? We just want to put some of our oil, cooking oil in, I think about a couple tablespoons. Two tablespoons of canola oil is what the recipe says. Then you want to put the onions in over medium heat. Put the onions in. So many onions, so much flavor. And the onions can cook down pretty quickly. We slice them thinly, right? So um, it won't take long at all to cook these down a little bit. You'll get some aroma to filling your kitchen screen if you're cooking along. And so once we cook for a few minutes, the onions, then we add the garlic. If we were to add the garlic and the onions at the same time, the garlic, because it's minced so small, would probably potentially burn, <laughs> uh, which is why we wait a little bit to, before we add the garlic there. I'm just gonna leave it, let it do its thing. And then just reading ahead, we'll add the, the onion cooks a little, the garlic cooks a little, and then we add the tomato and, and then the chipotle peppers. That's it, then you just mix it up and let it go. And you really just because since the chicken is already cooked, you don't have to worry about cooking it. Um, you're really just flavoring it and coating it with the sauce. I can already start smelling the onions. They're starting to get a little bit... Um, just a little bit, so cooking down. I can already add the, I'll just throw in the, the garlic. Like I said, it's not, oops. Just adding in the garlic. Like I said, very forgiving. Honestly, if you threw it all together at once, it would still taste good if you didn't want to go step by step and just throw it in with the tomatoes too. You would miss out on the browning of the garlic, potential caramelization of the garlic, or excuse me, of the onion, which is why we do the onion first and cook it down a little bit. Um, the more that you cook down onion, the less of the bite that it has, but the more time it has to break down the carbohydrate, the, the cell walls in this onion and release the sugar, which is why, you know, if you've ever had raw onion versus caramelized onions, which essentially means it's just been cooking down and cooking down. The onion has had time um, to break down and actually break down to uh, simple, sh simpler sugars of the carbohydrate, which makes it sweet. Why I love caramelized onions. <laughs> so that's the reason why we, we, if we can, right, if you have the time, um, we cook down the onion a little bit. And you'll even see a little browning of the onion too, which I 
maybe it's hard to see on um, my camera. Yeah, it's a little hard maybe with the white lighting, but I can see a little um, rounding on my end, and that's what's happening. You're converting, it's science, you're converting, uh, breaking down the carbohydrates. That's why it's sweet. Okay, onions in, garlic's in. I'm gonna add the tomatoes. Bunch of tomatoes. So right now we've added everything but the uh, chipotle peppers, correct? That's right. But also being able to make this in a big batch, being able to you know use shredded chicken for multiple purposes, being able to, um, once you have cooked this, I'm gonna add the chipotle peppers right now. Once um, you're done with like the batch of chicken tinga that you've made, you can freeze that by itself too, and that keeps well. So now I'm just adding, adding the chipotle, and so I like the sauce, especially if you don't want a lot of extra super spicy. Um, but just like the flavor and the smokiness, I'm going to add just straight sauce. I think what's really nice about this is like uh, adobo and chipotle are very strong flavors, but the tomatoes and the onion really help really kind of soften that without taking away the magnificence of the flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they really complement each other. Pretty good recipe. <laughs> I would make this again, honestly. And if you have leftover from your tacos, you can always make sopes, which is always a delicious way to have leftover taco insides. Mm -hmm. All right. It's cut down. You can actually see the, the tomato juice coming out. So these are pretty juicy. Um, so it's looking good there. Now, any type of thing that you ever cook, always salt and pepper. Always salt and pepper. <laughs> do it to taste. Everyone's tastes are different. But please don't forget to do that. I feel, you know, a lot of people are salt conscious too, which I understand why for reason. Salt is important for our bodies as well, um, but also for flavor, right? If it doesn't taste good, you're not gonna do it or eat it for very long. So um, don't, like, it, it, a little can go a long way. Um, I'm going to, oh, I can smell it. I'm gonna add some salt in. Yeah, and you'll notice that it's not, it's not specified how much, it just says to taste. Um, remember that you can always add more, but you can't go back <laughs> if you add too much. I'm going to get some pepper. I have two. Ooh. And this puppy is ready for some chicken. I'm going to add that soon. So always taste, taste, add, taste, add. Don't burn yourself. I'm going to bring over the chicken now. This would be, I think, I mean, even um, some of my friends, uh, one girl's birthday, she was, uh, she had the nice idea of, since, you know, we're socially distancing, um, to do like a cook along with her friends. And so this could be something that y'all, you, you know, um, if you wanted to, you could bring it to your friends. I think it's like simple, if you didn't want to cook the chicken too, you could just buy rotisserie chicken and make a sauce um, and just have like a taco night. I think that'd be kind of cool and easy. So again, just make sure it's all the sauce, everything well incorporated. You don't want a dry chicken piece in there. You want all this, the sauce to get on. Okay. 
I'm facing it. I need more salt. Also, too, um, like you can use other condiments. Like I know I'm, I got cilantro ready. I have lime ready. <laughs> um, sour cream for my tacos. Yeah, and that's it, y'all. Like as simple as that. And so take a look at how much filling you have, right? Tacos, burritos. Rice plates, um, it's, it's a lot. Because you've actually added a lot of bulk from the veggies, um, but also a lot of flavor. So that is it. Here's, if you have time, I would actually heat these. <laughs> you heat the corn tortillas. But I don't want to take up too much of y'all's time. So um, this is just ready to go, ready to eat.